Okay, so here is the completed transformer. You can see I've got my ground spike running through the CB antenna mount. I also did something here. I added a little uh, electrical terminal and put it through the other screw on the BNC chassis mount. This grounds, or it, it takes the ground from the antenna line runs it to the spike. So now the spike is grounded. And also this is another little wire that I have coming off to make a counterpoise. And this is a 67 foot counterpoise wire. I made this with uh, 20 AWG silicon wire. So not sure how that's gonna perform on high power, but we're gonna find out. Um, for most of the time when I'm activating on a summit, this will work just fine because I'm usually running low power but we're gonna try this out with the 7300. We've got our Chameleon SS17 spike, which I did not homebrew because this is a very nice piece of equipment. And I've got about, I think this is 25 feet, no, 50 feet. It is 50 feet, it says it right there. 50 feet of uh, LMR 400, I think. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's LMR 400. That's pretty stiff. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to run a quick RF safety check and then uh, I'm going to spike this thing in the yard and we're going to see how it performs on the 7300. Okay, so to be RF safe, we have to be about 22 feet away from this antenna. <clears throat> so um, this is about 22 feet. Um, actually, it's over 22 feet, but both for RF safety and where I'm physically located here. But all right, we'll just spike this into the ground. Okay, that is spiked. <clears throat> and we'll hook up our chameleon whip to help if I hold it the right way. All right, let's extend this out. I had to pull harder on each of those sections. So that's the whip now. That's more like it. It's a big whip. Okay, so we're about to fire up the 7300. We got the whip out there. 7300's hooked up to the battery box from the Jeep. So let's see what we get first with a multi SWR reading. That looks pretty good. That's a little bit different from what I saw last night, but I was using, I think it's RG213, which is a very tiny coax cable. Um, but um, still looks pretty good here. I did shorten the counterpoise, so let me lengthen that counterpoise and see if it looks any better on 40 when I do that. I, I doubled it back on itself to make it 60 feet instead of 67 feet. Okay, and it turns out the other coax I used was actually RG174, so it's still a very thin cable. And about the same. Okay, so I'm probably noticing some differences in SWR here because of um, the differences in the cable and length of cable. Uh, these SWRs are higher than what I saw yesterday, but still very usable. So um, since the 7300 has a built-in tuner, we're gonna fire it up and see how it does. I also wonder if using a thicker wire for the counterpoise would be better. Um, I just have that 20 AWG on it, so I wonder if like a 14 AWG or 18 AWG would be better for this. Okay, so something is wrong. Um, this is the waterfall when I run off of the fan dipole that I have. Um, nice, good waterfall on 40, a lot of activity. Looks like what I would expect. Uh, it's Memorial Day, looks like what I would expect on a holiday. Um, here's what it looks like on the new antenna. Okay. This is what it looks like with the new antenna. Also, just to show this, the SWR on 40 meters is down at like a 1.5, but I can't figure out why. I can't figure out why I'm not seeing more activity on the waterfall. Um, 
So it might be that there's still something up with the transformer. Okay, so I have a feeling that something is wrong with that transformer. So uh, I've got my super antenna spike mount here. What I'm gonna do is put the SS17 whip on here and just do a quick comparison of what the waterfall looks like. All right, so this is just running the SS17 whip off of the super antenna base. As you can see, this is a very different waterfall. And uh, the SS17 is resonant on 14 megahertz. It's resonant across 20. Um, if I run an SWR check here, Five across the band so um, anyway uh, not sure what's going on I have a feeling it has something to do with the center pin on that SO239 that is running to the whip okay so here's what I think is going on this piece here that was supposed to go to the center pin yeah it um, it basically just pulled right out. It was never fully attached in there. So what I'm gonna do instead, because I hate soldering and I'm done with trying to make that work, I'm gonna drill a hole in the back of the box, run this out, and then run a terminal up here to this for my positive connection. So uh, we're gonna try that, and then we're gonna see if we get better results. So just so you can see what I'm doing here, um, I have the wire running out the back and up. And all that the SO239 is doing at this point is holding the box up on the mount. So that's just a structural connection point at this point. Um, it is grounded, so I don't want to short anything between the transformer and that uh, metal body. But what I can do is I'm going to put this terminal ring here. on the center pin and uh, that should give me a good connection. Okay and now we have a good solid connection to that lock washer or, or not to the lock washer I'm sorry to the uh, 3 8 to 24 nut and uh, yeah this should be a great connection let's go test this out. All right we're gonna give this a shot on 40 meters and see if I can get anybody KO4 DFC is the frequency in use. Kilo Oscar 4 Delta Foxtrot Charlie is the frequency in use. Okay. I think that there's something still wrong with that transformer. And uh, I don't have time to troubleshoot it right now, but we'll have to keep working with it. So as you can see, I've got a few new pieces of equipment here. Uh, the first thing, maybe one of the most important things, is this helping hands set up. Uh, this was like, I think this was 15 bucks on Amazon. It's going to help hold things in place so that I can just touch the solder and the iron to the places I need to solder instead of trying to just do it with two hands. Uh, now I have six. Um, I have disassembled the original transformer. That I put together which uh, took a while I, I think the solder that I was using was not very good and I know that because I had to crank this soldering iron which is new this is a Yihua 8786D and uh, I had to crank this all the way up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit just to get the old solder to melt and come off so I think that was just bad solder for this project what I'm going to use instead today is this uh, MG Chemicals 6040 10 lead solder. This is uh, rosin core. Uh, it mentions that it's 2.2% flux, so there is a, a rosin core in this solder. This is also the 0 0.032, or that's about 
um, eight millimeter, or 0.8 millimeter um, solder. And uh, that should do much, much better. Um, I don't necessarily like having to use a product with lead, but when it comes to electronics and soldering from everything that I have been reading, uh, it's, it seems like that's still just kind of where things are at. I'd love to use lead-free solder. If you do know of some good lead-free solder products, uh, please let me know because I'd be glad to uh, switch to those if, if they work as well as I'm hoping this will. Um, there is some tip tuner. This is to help make sure that uh, the soldering iron tip stays clean. Because I'm working with leaded solder, although this would be good for any solder, um, I've also got this USB powered fan, uh, the Gaia Top, that I got off Amazon. And it's got two or three different settings here, which if I turn on the USB brick, and this blows quite a bit of air. Um, it's, it's actually a, a quite, quite good power for its size. You could use like an old PC fan or something maybe, but this is going to blow while I'm working and make sure that I do not inhale any of the solder fumes while I'm working. Um, I've also got some gloves. Since we're dealing with lead, I've got a headlamp because I'm outside on the back porch and uh, as, as I lose daylight, I'll still want to be able to work out here. And uh, that's most of it. So yeah, I also got this. This is a copper pipe reamer. Um, I used this to take all of the jagged stuff out of the copper tubes. So these are much cleaner now. Um, not perfect, but much less prone to uh, cutting through any insulation on wires I've got now. So that's the new setup fan, soldering iron and heat gun. Uh, I've got the helping hands and the tip tenor or the new solder. We're gonna try this out and uh, we're gonna see how it goes. I know that something was going on with the electrical connections because I took a 150 ohm and 100 ohm resistor and I um, just kind of twisted the wires together here. I don't know if I can get the camera to focus. Um, let's see if it'll, will it focus? There we go. So twisted those together. That's, um, these are pretty cheap. Um, it's just like a thousand piece box off Amazon. Twisted those together to give me a 250 ohm resistance. And then what I was able to do is connect the antenna wire to the ground wire with the transformer still assembled. And I hooked it up to my antenna analyzer to check SWR. Uh, when I hooked it up to the antenna analyzer, I was initially getting some readings, SWR readings of like anywhere between like 1.5 and 2.5 across all the bands. But if I pushed on the transformer at all while it was in here, it would skyrocket to literally saying infinity on the readout. So I think that part of what was happening is the solder connections were just not good in all of these places between like the BNC connector and uh, the PCB boards. So hopefully by using better solder, uh, we'll get some better connections, we'll get better results, and we'll get some good signals. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's all the new gear, so let's get to it. And also, I forgot to mention this, but since we're working with lead, I bought a new trash can specifically to put any lead waste in. Uh, what I'll do is take that, and then depending on what is required to dispose of hazardous waste, I'll make sure to take care of that here in the community. You don't want to dump leaded stuff in the trash. Um, so that will contain it and uh, it'll go to the right place. The first thing I needed to do was to solder the copper pipes to the PCB and that required using a blowtorch as you see here. Um, in this part of the video I wasn't actually able to do it. My uh, iPhone died and so um, you won't actually see me get the solder here but you really have to hold that blowtorch on there for a while. Um, probably 
I don't know, I probably held it on there for 30 seconds. So maybe, maybe more like a minute. But essentially, the copper has to get pretty hot because you're trying to get it and the PCB hot enough to get the solder on there. You also need to do that with the toroids on. Because, of course, if you don't do it with the toroids on, then you won't be able to get the toroids on once you solder the pipes to the PCB. Um, I also went back through and checked all of my connections and re-soldered things where I needed to. The unleaded solder gave me a lot of trouble here. So um, I think I, I would recommend the 6040 lead tin solder if you have it. Just be careful with it because it does contain lead. Uh, but the unleaded solder did not flow well. I had to really crank my iron up to, I think I had it at 800 degrees Fahrenheit in order to get the unleaded solder to melt. And then once I added some of the 6040 solder to that, uh, then some, some of it would melt and some of it wouldn't. It was kind of a mess. So I was able to get it cleaned up. Uh, and then eventually here I've got the 250 ohm resistive load hooked up to the transformer and you can see when you run it on a rig expert you get a nice flat swr across the whole band this gave me a good waterfall and it enabled me to um, make sure that things were working before i tried to deploy in the field